What's up, everybody? This is the Believe in Blazers podcast presented by Bet Online. I'm in a new spot, Tori, coming live from the Pac West Center, 7:50. The game. This is uh, basically a reaction right after the trade deadline. We're recording 1:22 in the afternoon. Trade deadline just became officially done. Trailblazers, of course, don't do much. Tori, what's up, man? How, how are you? I, I, I kind of know how you're feeling, but uh, how are you feeling? <laughs> Um, so I pulled an all-nighter last night preparing for my trade deadline stream today. You can see our live reaction, me and Eric Brandt over there on Blazers Uprise. You can see our reaction to every trade live, like as it happened with a stream chat that was popping. Um, so I haven't slept in like 24 hours and I'm very annoyed at what the Blazers did today. Well, I don't blame you. Uh, but first of all, as always... We're presented by Bet Online and Bet Online Range number one source for all your sports betting this season. Um, we got the Super Bowl coming up, Tori. Super Bowl coming up. You can bet on that. Get the latest odds, team matchup, info, player news, all that good stuff. Uh, head over to the website today. More your mobile device. Receive a 50% off welcome bonus with your first deposit. Use the promo code BELIEVE. That's BELIEVE, B L E A V, to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. Of course, just bet the Super Bowl over there. That, that's the big one to bet. But of course, you can always bet the Blazers now. And uh, it seems like to me, Tori, the Blazers, uh, they did not improve their team. That's for sure. Um, I can say that very confidently. They didn't improve the team at the trade deadline. Um, but I don't think they necessarily you know, made them worse. And they acquired some draft picks. So like, I understand. Here's the thing. I'm going to put this out here. And I tweeted this. I'm going to pull up my exact tweet, word for word. That way I don't mess it up. Uh, all right, let's see here. So I said the Blazers aren't built. They're not about building around Dame. And I've been saying this for a while, which I have been. Dame gets his numbers, plays in Portland as long as he wants. They're gathering assets for when Dame's closer to the end. Today they got uh, – I put six draft picks. I was, in a, I was in a rage. I was in a hurry. It got six. But uh, – and the roster is ba- – and the roster is basically the same. So, like, I truly believe that. Like, I truly believe the Blazers are looking at this roster and they're saying – Look at the Western Conference, and we don't fit. After the Kevin Durant move to the Suns, after the Kyrie move to the Mavericks, you could even say the D'Angelo Russell move, Jared Vanderbilt, all those guys going to the Lakers. Like, the Blazers don't fit in right now in the Western Conference. And I think Joe Cronin is looking at it and saying, you know what, we're going to build for kind of the future, and we're going to let Dame ride it out, kind of like the Lakers let Kobe ride it out at the end. And just get your stats, get your numbers, stay as long as you want in Portland. And then in a couple of years, hopefully they have enough pieces where they can build around Amphrey Simon, Shaden Sharp. And if Dame is still playing at a high level, Dame and Lillard as well. I really think that's what they're doing. And I think today was kind of the, you know, just the, the finality of that. Like you can kindly tell that's what they're doing. I think you hate this idea. I don't like the idea either because I want Dame to have a championship contender. I want to go all in. I don't think that they did the right thing. But uh, what do you think of that theory that I had, Tori? I think it's fine to build for two years from now, given the fact that the West got a lot better at this year's trade deadline. It wasn't even necessarily about them not going all in this year or trying to contend this year for me. The Josh Hart trade in isolation, I think, is okay. I think getting back that first is huge. Now... Blazer fans are put in the same position as they were last year, where they're hoping for a certain playoff scenario. This time we're rooting for the Knicks to make it, where last year we were rooting for the Pelicans to miss it. So hopefully the Blazers don't get screwed again, because that first becomes four second round picks if the Knicks miss the playoffs. I can't believe I'm have I'm gonna have to root for the New York Knicks now. Uh, that's fun. But um, I wasn't uh, value wise. That trade was fine. I think people are overhyping Cam Reddish way too much. Um, Josh Hart is clearly yeah. the better player. Josh Hart is better than anything the Blazers got back, which is why I think they got worse. Um, but that trade in isolation was fine. The problem is today, they did not really choose a, a direction. They got back three second round picks. Like, what's the point in trading for Matisse Thibel? If you're going after draft assets for building in the future, what's the point in trading for Matisse Thibel? Because Matisse Thibel is a one-dimensional defender. He's a good defender. Yes, the Blazers need defensive help, and you need somebody to replace GP2. But he's a one-dimensional player that you can't play in the playoffs. And it's like, he's a restricted free agent this summer. Who knows what he's going to get offered? That's going to be a whole mess. Why go out and get Matisse Thibel if your whole plan is to try and accumulate assets 
to try and build a year or two from now. It doesn't make sense. Like that in conjunction with trading off Gary Payton the second, which my problem with that trade is the the Warriors traded James Wiseman for Sadiq Bay, then basically flipped Sadiq Bay for five second round picks that they then flipped for Gary Payton the second. So Joe Cronin had his choice of James Wiseman, Sadiq Bay, or five second round picks, Stephen. And he chose the five second round picks. Apparently, he asked Golden State for more on top of Wiseman to get back for GP2. And then he got played. And they had to take five second round picks. So that was a misstep there. And I don't like that choice. So those are just a couple of the reasons, you know, there's more to this trade deadline that I'm frustrated with. But I'll let you give your thoughts on those couple of things. No, for sure. Um, I had heard early in the day that the Blazers were active in trying to get James Wiseman uh, for GP2. I had, uh, you know, I had heard that. I had read that and I was excited about it. I thought, you know, that's a, that's a good move. I think for Portland, it's a definitely not a for sure win, but it's one of those high upside plays you can get to get a guy like James Wiseman, get some height, uh, get some scoring ability. I think for Portland and, you know, if it really was the fact where, uh, you know, Cronin chose five second round picks instead of James Wiseman. Like that's a miss. That is a miss for sure. Um, and so, and that's how, how it worked out. You know, I texted, uh, I texted a guy, Evan Giddings, who we had on the pod. I texted him. I said, Hey, is there anything, any truth to this Wiseman for GP two? He hadn't heard anything, but he has said the Sadiq Bay Wiseman thing was real and they wanted to do it, but he didn't understand it either. So like, I think in a vacuum, like GP two for five second round picks, I think that's a good trade. Right, I, I might be wrong on that. I think that's a good value for Gary Payton II for a guy who obviously didn't want to be in Portland. Like, based on the way he played, the way he acted here, um, you know, all the stuff you had heard, like teammates didn't like him, the players didn't like it. Like, nobody really got along with GP2, and he got five second round picks. I think that's a that's a fine value to get back for a guy that wasn't going to help, wasn't part of the future. But I'm with you. Like, if you could have gotten, you know, James Wiseman. Sadiq Bay, like, yeah, you go out and get one of those guys. So I, that's definitely a miss on Joe Cronin's part. And uh, it is a little mind-boggling. Like, why you think five second-round picks is better than someone like that. Now, in regards to Thibel, I think you're right on with that, like, too. Like, what Thibel doesn't necessarily help. He, he fits the GP2 role. So, like, I guess the, the thought process would be, like, they don't want to necessarily just full on tank. They want to still act like they're going for the playoffs and they're still trying to get into that play in tournament. I get like, that would be the only thing that makes sense to bring back Thibel because he's like a worse GP two. Like that dude cannot play offensively, like cannot play offense. And so like, he's a worse GP two. Like, I, I don't know. I, it was mind boggling to me that they did that trade. Um, I don't see what value he really brings him. Like you said, restricted free agent at the end of the year. Like you don't want to have to overpay that guy. Like, he's not good enough to bring back. You have a guy like Nasir Little. Why did you just play Nasir Little more? Why did you just play Shane Sharp more? Like, you brought in you brought in Cam Reddish. There's no reason to bring in Thibault. So that was a really – that was a mystery to me as well. Like, what is the play here? Because, like I said, I think the direction they're going with is going for the future, but you gave up draft picks for that asset in Matisse Thibault that isn't going to provide anything. So I don't know, man. It, it was a really weird day. Um, I think – just looking at every move individually, like you could say, okay, it's a fine deal. But I think, as you said, you add it all up and it doesn't equal out what you want it to be. And for me, it's just like, if you're going to build for the future and you're going to try to get assets, just do it. And don't worry about all these plays you're getting back. Like go for the draft picks. And if you make the playoffs, you make the playoffs. If you don't, you don't like, that's just kind of where I'm at. But it just seems like the Blazers want to want to play the middle here. And be stuck in no man's land like they have for the last, you know, whatever, 20 years. It's frustrating, too, because those options for GP2 provides you with length, right? And we talk about how this team's too small, this team's too small. For some reason, Joe Cronin doesn't get as much blame for that as Neil Olshay did in the past, but Joe Cronin is the one who went out and signed Gary Payton the second after drafting a guard in Shaden Sharp. And the GP2 signing was an absolute debacle. Cronin got played, GP2 came here for the money, and then didn't want to be here, didn't want to play, sat out for a whole month after being cleared. Joe Cronin got absolutely played there, and then had to settle on trading him. But the fact that he could have gotten back a young big to be a part of that future if he pans out has upside. Those home run swings are what the Blazers need to do. 
because you need some of those to pan out. Like if you can get, you know, James Wiseman to pan out in a blazer uniform, you could be getting a really, really good big man down the road for GP2 and that's good value. So that's my problem with saying no to that is he could have fit a position of need. He could have helped out the blazers long term. And Cronin said no. So I basically just don't understand selling for second round picks, which are a more conservative play when this team needs to make big swings and James Wiseman would be that big swing. Uh, I think that was an absolute misstep there. Sadiq Bey as well could have been some length at the three that can shoot and has some defensive upside, has some two-way upside. And that's my biggest problem with a lot of Joe Cronin's moves is he doesn't find two-way players. He finds one-way players. Cam Reddish is not a good offensive player. He's a solid defensive player, but his motor is inconsistent. Kevin Knox is a bad defender. And honestly, he's been bad offensively up until limited minutes this year. He's just not good. Um, meanwhile, Keon Johnson, who we picked up, is a defensive guy who's very raw offensively still. Like, Matisse Thibel obviously is bad offensively, good defensively. Gary Payton the second isn't much of a two-way player outside of Golden State system. Like, Cronin just has a liking for these one-dimensional players that limit the upside of your team, that limit, limit how good you can be because every player he seems to target has some serious flaws on one side of the floor or the other. And I just don't understand that. Like, if the thought is to build in a couple years, like, why are you going out and getting yet another one-dimensional wing, especially? Because, I mean, you look at that position, man. Um, Nas, Shaden Sharp, Matisse Thibel, Kevin Knox can play some three, Keon Johnson, I think I'm forgetting someone, like, you have a ton of wings here, and it doesn't make much sense to have all those wings, so the Matisse Thibel trade didn't make sense, um, but then, I, I just, they didn't set themselves up to make a move this offseason, Steven, because when you look at their salary sheet, they don't have tradable contracts. They got Dame and Ant, but those are obviously big pieces. They're not like trade chips that you, you would use to match salary. You got Yusuf Nurkic, who moving is easier said than done, but if you trade him as a salary matcher along with, you know, a pick or two or a young player or two for a small forward, all of a sudden you have to fill your starting center spot. And you're back to square one. Outside of him, the next highest salary that isn't a free agent next summer... The next higher salary on the books that the Blazers can trade is Shaden Sharp at $6 million, Or Nasir Little at like $7 million. That's not much salary. And you don't want to trade Shaden Sharp unless it's for a high salary star. Right? So that's the problem is they don't have trade chips. And also this trade makes it more likely that they end up in the later lottery. Which means that they wouldn't have any of their future firsts next, next year. So... Not only did they make it more likely that they don't have first to trade this offseason, they also made it so they don't have contracts to trade this offseason. So what's the plan? Like, what? it doesn't make any sense. That's my whole problem with this entire trade deadline is like, there's no plan set forth that he's executing here. I cannot find a plan that he's executing right now. And it just seems like to me, it's like, <clears throat> this happens every year where all these teams are making moves and improving themselves and the Trailblazers are standing still. Like, this, it's just... I'm with you, man. It's it's frustrating because I want the Blazers to win. And, like, I know that I am a little more critical than you are of the Blazers and I'm always kind of, like, down on them. But, like, ultimately I want them to win. And they don't make moves that make, that make them win. And, man, it's just – it's frustrating, Tori. I'm with you because James Wiseman is the guy. Like, he's not a great player, right? Like, he hasn't proven anything in the NBA. But you're right when you say, let's take a big swing. Let's take some potential, like – the moves that they made, getting Cam Reddish, getting um, Matisse Thibel, like these just smell like Neil Olshay moves, right? Like hot, like high draft picks, either high high lottery picks or high rated high school players that haven't turned out yet, and they get them on the cheap. Like awesome, cool. Cam Reddish was a great athlete in high school. You know who else is a great athlete in high school? Every other NBA player in the league. Like. Let's not get the twisted. He has underperformed everywhere he's been. This is his third team in four years. Like, to expect anything out of him is crazy. The reason they traded Josh Hart's for that first-round pick, it wasn't Cam Reddish. Cam Reddish was just a throw-in to match contracts. Like, it was to get the first-round pick. So, like, it, it just seemed like another deal all trade deadline, but it was under Joe Cronin this time. Like, 
you touch on Thibel being just all defense, like, and winning. We've seen this. We've seen this story before. The Blazers, yeah, they suck at defense, and that's understandable. So Joker and Gozak gets good defenders. I guess in theory it makes sense, but no, it doesn't because all it's going to do is going to put more pressure on Damian Lillard to score every time he has the basketball in big time games. And you know what? That doesn't work in the playoffs. It doesn't work. And like, it's just the same thing over and over, man. It's it's so frustrating. I'm with you. I and I'll be the first to admit, I was happy when Neil O'Shea was gone. I thought Joe Cronin was going to, you know, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought that he was going to do some nice things. I defended some of the trades last season, even though on paper it didn't look great. I was like, you know what? I understand what he's doing. Like, I can see a path, and I see the path he's trying to go this year, but it, it's not working. And I don't think he's done a very good job, and I'll admit I was wrong. Like, it's okay to admit that, um, that he hasn't done a very good job, and I don't know how he's going to get himself out of it. Like, I mean, realistically, Tori, look at the Western Conference now. Like, where do the Blazers fit in? Like, they're out. I mean, they're outside the play-in, aren't they? Like, the Lakers have uh, have jumped them. And so, like, like you're looking at the Blazers' best case scenario. They're the ten seed in the Western Conference, probably. Like, that. I mean, that's that's not good. That's not good when Damian Lillard's 32 years old, 33 years old, and you know, it's not that he's at the end, but he's played about as good as he's ever played in his life. Like, that's how good he's been doing, and they're still not even going to be in the play-in. Like, what? That, that just doesn't – it's not good, man. It's just not – it's not a good – it's not a good sight. Yep. I mean, they are completely stuck. Um, that's well, the- I want to ask, ask you this real quick. So, Chris Chris Haynes tweeted out, teams were calling about Damian Lillard. Joe Cronin said, off the table, unequivocally, no, we're not trading him. I know you're not trade team Dame, but, <laughs> like – would it be surprising if Dame is traded in the offseason? I mean, I don't know why you'd I don't know why you'd purposely like say no. We're definitely not trading him right now, and then just trade him in the offseason. Um, I mean, I think it just comes down to does Dame want out or not. Um, if Dame wants out, then yeah, he gets traded. If he doesn't want out, then I think he stays. I think that's always how it's been. I think that's always how it will be. Um, and if ownership wants to go back on that and trade him against his wishes, then first ownership needs to freaking sell the team. Yeah. I mean, ultimately I think Tori, that is, that's the biggest thing over this. The cloud over this franchise is just the ownership, right? Like Jody Allen, Burt cold. They're not the people to run the team and they, they haven't been, and they've done a bad job doing it. And when they hired Joe Cronin, they didn't even interview anybody. They just gave Joe Cronin the job. Like, imagine doing that. Imagine seeing what Utah's doing with Danny Ainge and getting all these draft picks and, you know, just trading all these dudes and getting so much value for them. The, I had heard he was interested in the job with Portland. He was interested in the Blazers' job. Not that he would take it. Not that he would be offered it. Not that any of that. But he had interest in it. He wanted to talk to him. They didn't reach out to him. They didn't reach out to anybody. And they just gave it to Joe Cronin. Like, I think ultimately, like, that's the cloud hanging over this franchise right now is Jody Albert Cole not being the right owners. And it's really hurting Damian Lillard in the long run because they can't decide what they want to do. Like we can't go all in. We can't sell off everybody. Like we're trying to be that middle ground. We're trying to make the playoffs, but we're also trying to build for the future. Like that's the stuff that doesn't work. That's what gets you the eight seed, the seven seed. And for me, like I just want a championship. That's all I ever want. I just want to get a championship. I think we can think about it different ways to get there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I want a championship. They're not doing anything to do help with that. They're either – they're just being the eight seed right now. And that stuff doesn't I, – I don't like it. I don't like to watch them get swept in the first round of the playoffs by the Denver Nuggets. Like, I, it's not fun. So, oh, it is frustrating today, man. And it's just like I try to just, like, laugh it off and just make jokes about it. But it's like when you really deep dive into it, like, it's a really bad job. And I think, you know, Joe Cronin, I gave him the benefit of the doubt for basically a year, see what he can do. And uh, I would say he's definitely failed by expectations big time. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand why people gave him the benefit of the doubt, though, because... Well, because I, I, I mean, I, I gave O'Shea the benefit of the doubt, too. That's the thing. I, I'm going to give these guys the benefit of the doubt. I've given Chauncey the benefit of the doubt, but Cronin, now Cronin's proven, like, he, he hasn't done a great job so far. In my opinion, the Clippers trade to start off last year's deadline was worse than any move Olshay had done 
that was like easily foreseeable. Like obviously if Olshay could have drafted OG at it over your Bam out of bio, that would have been a much better move. So drafting Zach Collins was really bad, but that's hindsight, right? Like at the time, the fact that they traded an efficient 20 point per game score and Robert Covington, who I still think had value and people wanted to say, oh, he's a negative contract or whatever. He was expiring or whatever. The Clippers extended him for the same amount and the Clippers obviously valued him. The fact that he couldn't get back a single first round pick for a, an efficient 20 point per game scorer and Robert Covington at last year's deadline was a major, major red flag. And everybody wanted to say, oh, well, he was in the luxury tax, so he had no leverage, so he had to do that. But the CJ trade that was coming down the line would have gotten them under the tax anyway. Would have, like, they were way under the tax after the CJ trade. And even if the Blazers are still in the tax, the Pelicans still do it because they were desperate for a lead guard. And they got him on good value. And they felt like it was good value. So that whole narrative last deadline just showed me I can't trust this guy to make a trade where we win in terms of asset value. And every other move leading up to this point outside the Jeremy Grant trade, which only happened because Jeremy Grant wanted to come here, every other move has gone bad. The GP2 signing has gone bad. I guess the sharp pick's fine. Like, I'm not talking draft, but the GP2 signing was terrible. He got absolutely played. Um, Justice Winslow hasn't really worked out this year. Um, Josh Hart had the yips this year, right? Like, so many players that Joe Cronin brought in hasn't haven't worked out this year. And people want to criticize the team for a lack of size. And the thing is, is Cronin kept it going with what Olshay was doing. Cronin, at last year's trade deadline, said that Afterwards, he felt like they needed to balance the roster more in terms of size. And then he goes and he doubles down on the same small lineups. And then every, everybody's complaining about a lack of size. But people say, oh, well, he's just trying to clean up Joe Cronin's mess. Well, no, he's the one who brought in GP2. He's the one who drafted Shaden Sharp. You know, he he's the one who built a good portion of this roster. He got Josh Hart back in a trade. I do want to ask you about Josh Hart real quick. Uh, the trade to New York. Do you think that's good value to get back for a first round pick? And Cam Reddish, I guess. Yeah, I think the value there was fine. I mean, that's the that's the best trade he's made. Right. Was getting a yeah, first yeah. for Josh Hart. The bar's not high. No. No, I agree. Um, I just wanted to clarify that to make sure. But uh no, I I'm with you. Like, um Cronin has said a lot of things, right? Like he has said a lot of the things that we wanted to hear. After Neil O'Shea was gone, he said we want to build around Dame. Uh, this team isn't better. We need to acquire better players. He has said all these things. We need to get bigger. We need to, you know, um, fully uh, maximize the roster. Need, he said all these things, and nothing has changed. Like that—that's—that's that's my problem. Is that it's just—it's—it's it's been a Neil Shane trade deadline. I've seen this story numerous times, and it turns out to be nothing. Now I will say, Tori, a couple positives out of it. Uh, if you are a Damian Lillard fan, like the report I said earlier, Chris Haynes. Said he's not available. I think that's got to make you happy if you're a Dame fan. And I think that's really all Blazer fans have going for them is that Damian Lillard is here in Portland. If it wasn't for him, I don't know what else you're cheering for. So uh, I think that's a positive. I, um, like I said, I think the Josh Hart trade, they had to trade him. And they got a you know protected first-round pick. I think that's fine for him. Take a flyer at Cam Reddish, whatever. I expect literally nothing out of that as he's been on so many teams. And the other one that I'm actually really happy about – was a move he didn't make, and that's not to trade Shane Sharp. Um, I was worried coming into the trade deadline because Sharp had been struggling lately. He played well um, against the Warriors, but he had been struggling a lot, and I thought, okay, this is a time where Blazer fans are jumping on board to trade Shane Sharp. Um, I think Blazer fans were wouldn't be super mad if they traded him for an OG Ananobi or something like that, and I did not want that. I, I want the Blazers to hang on to this guy. I think this guy has so much potential – uh, it's just oozing out of him. He's so young. He's still learning the game. Like that, that You tank for a reason. You tank to get a guy with that type of potential, that type of value. I didn't want him to trade it after year one. So I will say I'm going to give props to Joe Cronin on that one to not give in to you know, what Toronto is asking for and not to give in to that and to hang on to Shane Sharp. So um, what is that? were you happy about that or were you looking for them to trade him also? I mean, I was happy about that because you're not going to contend right now. You have to play for a futurist, futuristic window. And that's the thing is they don't have enough assets to make the proper moves to get them to contention level right now. They just don't have enough assets for that. The only way they get there is by having 
you know, singular assets pop. You know, like... That's why Wiseman would have been so nice. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So if Shaden Sharp pops the next couple years and turns into a borderline all-star in two seasons, I mean, in order to get a borderline all-star in OG, you're talking about trading Sharp and maybe having to trade a first or trading extra assets on top of him or something crazy, you know what I mean? And that's the same thing with Simon still being 23 and getting better. Um, like, yeah, you can trade them and maybe get an all-star, but does it take you to contention? Probably not. What if those guys pop in a couple years? Are you better then compared to trading them now? Probably if they pop. So that's what you have to hope for. And right now, at this point, being the 7th, the 8th seed by making a move trading Shane Sharp is not, is not good. Maybe you could compete with Memphis if you made the right trade, right? But at the end, you're going up against KD and the Phoenix Suns. Like, you're not going to beat that team. So I'm all for trying to cash in on the draft this year if you can find somebody in the draft then all, by all means i mean the blazers are only a couple games away from having the seventh or eighth best lottery odds at that point you can talk about oh well what in 20 chance that we could get victor Wenbanyama? i mean that would change the franchise that would completely fix everything if that happened but this is also a really deep draft so having two first round picks in it um, not only can you move those on deadline day, um, or a non deadline day draft day, uh, you can trade both first after, um, you know, players have been selected. You can word it weird. Like the stepping rule doesn't really apply on draft day specifically for those trades, um, for those picks. So you can trade both those first if something becomes available, but that's where it comes back to, man, we don't have salary chips to match salary. That's part of why trading Gary Payton the second sucked so bad was he was eight and a half million dollars of outgoing salary. And now you just don't have that. Is the best is the best scenario going forward? Well not best scenario, but is the most uh, let me let me see how I can word this. Is it the the most likely way for the Blazers to win a championship is to be bad this year and go for a Wimpin Yama? Basically, yeah, but Dave's not gonna be on board with tanking. Like, you're basically stuck. You can't just outright tank. But then again, it's like this team is bad enough where, okay, well, you could naturally play your way into having the eighth best odds. But they're also good enough to compete for the play-in because they have a guy like David Lillard. You know? Like, they're stuck, man. They are stuck again for yeah. the umpteenth time in a row. Like, I just – it's frustrating, man. That's the thing is, like, everybody's – talks about how Cronin has a plan, right, in the trade deadline last year was a part of a plan, and this year they weren't supposed to contend and this and that, right? Are we any closer to being unstuck than we were a year ago? Mm, nah, yes, because they have Shade Sharp. That's it. That's and the only Sanders, reason. That's the only reason. That's the only thing that's changed. If you take that of, out of the equation, so tanking last year was a success. If you take that out of the equation, it's literally the same. I think we're more stuck if you take Sharp out of the equation. So that's the thing. It's like every other trade, I understand making us worse last year so we could tank to get Shane Sharp, but it's like those trades should have added up to something more than Sharp that could have gotten us closer to getting to that next level. And instead, those trades have been so bad that I'd say we're more stuck without Shane Sharp. Yeah, and now you are putting yourself in a position where you're going to resign Jeremy Grant, which is fine. Um... I don't know about you, Tori, but on the court real quick about Jeremy Grant. He has been not as good lately. I'm really interested to see what he's going to get, man. What money he gets. I am afraid the Blazers are going to overpay that guy. But that's another you story. Have to. Um, you have to. I, you can't you have lose to. him. You can't. He has all the leverage. He has every single leverage point that you, he needs. Like, what's going to stop him from asking for the maximum contract? Uh, yeah. What are the Blazers going to say? No? Like, and just lose him for nothing? You and then you're way off. It's it. Oh, this yeah. No, they're stuck. They're they're more stuck now than they were a season ago. The only positive they have is Shaden Sharp, um, and now hopefully you know either Cronin and Mike Schmitz get to work and they hit on this draft pick with the Knicks, or they hit on their own draft pick or something. But yeah, dude, it's um, bleak times. It's bleak times. I'll say. Yeah. Um. There's a question I was gonna ask you. Well, first let me ask you this while I try to remember the other question. Who do you start at the three? For the rest of the year. It's got to be Nasir, right? It's got to be Nasir Little, I would guess. I, I don't want to put Fiebel out there. I don't I don't care. I don't care about him. Uh, you know, I, I, I know his game. Um, I think Nasir Little, Chauncey's talked about it. Like, we've seen some potential out of that guy. 
Um, he played well against the Warriors. Like I think I think it's Desir or Shaden Sharp, but I think right now it's Desir Little. I don't necessarily want to throw Shaden Sharp out there um, for the rest of the season. So I think I think it's Desir. I say screw it and throw Sharp out there. I mean that might help you with the tank, but you know, like you could pitch it as. His upside gives us the best chance to win games at the same time. And, you know, Dame believes in him. That could be your best way. And, I mean, if he starts popping, then you're not worried about, like, oh, well, we're actually going to end up in the play-in or the playoffs because Shane Sharp's playing really well. That's not a bad thing, right? That's a good thing. I mean, I will say another thing, like, and to go to my initial point of they're building for the future, they trade Josh Hart, they get Cam Reddish, they get Matisse Thibel, but it's to open up minutes for Shane Sharp. Right? Am I wrong about that? Like they want to get him more minutes. Well, why are you adding two wings for one then? Or you traded two away two just, wings? Because they don't. They're basically they're, they're trading Hart just so they can get Shane Sharp more minutes. Because Josh Hart is good. You're gonna Cam play Reddish. Cam Reddish. You're gonna play Matisse Thybul. But they're no good. Tori. that's the thing. They're not good, so they don't deserve minutes. Like Josh Hart is good enough in the NBA to deserve but the minutes. The thing is, GP two was barely playing anyway. Because he's not good either. I can tell you what, Warrior fans, they're happy. I was talking to my guy Evan, our guy. Mm-hmm. He is not happy. He is not happy about that trade. Really? He hates that trade. Yep. He hates it. Wow. But I uh, yeah, I don't know. Gary Payton the second for me is Raymond Felton two point I, I, he's he's on my hate list now, for a couple different reasons. One, there was a quote last off season where he was a. Uh, talking to a Warriors podcast and they asked him why he left for Portland and he just said the money and I quote tweeted that and I said that's not exactly what you'd want to hear as a Blazer fan and I got a lot of heat for that for some reason like you I think I, I think I even responded to it yeah you gave me heat for that well it turns out Steven guess what you were, you were was, right I was wrong <laughs> exactly like he said it he came here for the money because he did not want to play for the Portland Trail Blazers and it became obvious. He was cleared in December, early December. Did not play till January. My co-host on Blazers Uprise, Eric Brandt, had a source um, regarding when he would play. Supposedly, he told Chauncey Billups and the team that he would play on Monday, December 26th against the Charlotte Hornets. That time came up. And he said he didn't want to play because he didn't want to have his injury flare up because he wanted to play that following Friday on the 30th. Remember, there was like three days off in between there. He didn't want to have a setback to where he couldn't play when he got his ring against Golden State on the 30th, but that he was for sure going to play. So Eric tweeted out with full confidence, taking GP2 for his word, right, that he would play. And apparently Chauncey Billups went to him on that Thursday, the day before the game, and asked him, are you still good to play? And GP2 said, nah, I'll play next game, though. He did not want to play in a Blazer uniform. He obviously cashed out. There's something else I heard, like he was just kind of like a distraction. And when you see him on the court, he was doing all these antics and just didn't even seem to, like, really care, you know? I know he's a happy-go-lucky dude, but it was like... It was like he was just screwing off at times on the court. His defense wasn't as good as it was in Golden State. I think that dude went here for the money and never cared about playing here. And then he sits out and doesn't... He's healthy. He's cleared to play. And he just cares so little about playing. He doesn't suit up. Doesn't take the court. I hate that. I hate that. I can't stand him now. That's Raymond Felton 2.0 for me. Um, I would boo the dude if he played in Moto tomorrow. Ooh, Ooh. that's a hot, that's hot take. I don't uh, I don't hate it. I mean, I had heard things. You know, I had heard things. I told you things uh, that I can't say on air that I had heard about GP2, and it's been you know it's been out there that uh, he'd been a distraction to teammates, coaching staff, front office, all that kind of stuff. Like he'd been a headache. So you know, I'm glad that it's over. I'm glad that the disaster of GP2 is over. Uh, he goes down in history with Festus Azili, Andrew Nicholson, Anderson Verjao, all those guys. Infamous Blazers just, all right, cool, get out of here. So I was very happy he was off the team. And um, it's disappointing because, you know, he played at Oregon State. Like, he had all the makings of being a fan favorite. And you're right, like, he just did not care. He did not care to be here in Portland. And it was something that Portland needed, too. Portland needed his wing defense, and he just didn't provide it. So I'm glad he's gone. It's very disappointing. 
um, in GP2. But, uh, Tori, real quick here, uh, let me ask you, are the Suns the new favorite in the NBA? Uh, they are in the West. I'm not sure about the entire NBA. I have to see what they look like first before saying they're better than Boston. What about Milwaukee? I mean, Milwaukee, I feel like they're same tier. It's kind of hard to say. The thing is, Phoenix doesn't have a bench, so I have to see what they do in the buyout market. Yeah, the buyout market. Um, what about the Lakers? Are the Lakers better? You know, you you clown me. What was a couple episodes that I kept talking about the Lakers being better than <laughs> See, the Blazers? You brought them up so many times I that it did. managed to work out for them. I blame you. I, I'll take the blame on that. Are the Lakers better than the Blazers right now? Yes. <laughs> how <laughs> yeah. on a scale of one to ten, how sad were you when you saw the reports that the Lakers were going to get Jared Vanderbilt? Bro, how in the world did they only trade one first and they got D'Angelo Russell, Malik Beasley, and Jared Vanderbilt? Supposedly, Malik Beasley and Jared Vanderbilt were supposed to go for one first-round pick apiece, and they're the second and third best players that the Lakers got back. What? Like, why did they, why did they just gifted the Lakers three high-caliber rotation players and they for got one Rui. first-round pick? And they got really, they, they and got all these dudes for like Russell Westbrook and a couple draft picks. Like the, the pick isn't even unprotected. It's top four protected. Oh god, man. Like I I I just imagine if the Blazers did a trade like that where they got like you know, two two superstars and you know that you surrounded with the right team, they're contenders. You got Dame and you got somebody better than Ant, right? Like Dame and KD or something. But you're just your the light up sucks. And all of a sudden you just swing one first and you get like Three rotation players swing a couple seconds, get Rui, swing Patrick Beverly and get Mo Bamba. <laughs> Dude, oh my god. I I would that would probably be the happiest day or couple of days I've ever had as a Blazer fan. Is that because they're the Lakers, or is that because you think Joe Cronin sucks, or is that Rob Palinka? Like, what is the reason for that? Is it just because well, it's the Lakers? Rob Palinka sucks, but he every dog has his Does day, he? I guess. Does he suck? He's won I mean, a championship. He's sucked he brought until an today. AD, and now he's bro, he bro, 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 moves. bro, bro, bro. Yes, because LeBron signed here because LeBron wanted to be in LA. Like that wasn't Rob Palinka. He doesn't get any yeah, credit but, for that. But LeBron, LeBron also made these moves. LeBron's as much of the GM as Palinka is, right? We talk about LeBron getting his dudes or whatever. Like AD wanted to be here because LeBron was here. And Palinka just had all these young assets from the prior regime that he could just flip for AD. So then he got LeBron and AD, and they go and win a bubble championship. Like, does that even count? Yeah, I don't even give Palinka credit for that. And then the following years, he thinks Russell Westbrook makes sense as a third option next to AD. No, and LeBron. Le- LeBron did. LeBron did. But like that as a GM, LeBron. when do you step in? But that's the thing. Okay, so if it's all LeBron, then why does why does Palinka get credit? You know what I mean? Like Palinka's not good. He two years in a row, they surrounded LeBron with non shooters. That's fair. And it didn't work. Like, I what has Palinka done? And then all of a sudden today, well today he did a lot. Yeah, well the Blazers went out and got Larry Dance for draft picks, and now they have none. So good for us. For as much draft pa- capital as the Lakers gave up. For three better players. <laughs> Think about that. God. This is so frustrating. All right. I'm, t- I'm done. I'm done, Tori. <laughs> I'm, hopping on the, I'm hopping on the Suns bandwagon because they're good now. You would. <laughs> uh, I will say, though, the Jared Vanderbilt thing, I got some confirmation from a couple people that yeah. said the Blazers, the Blazers were legitimately interested in Jared Vanderbilt, and they did offer two second-round picks. And that was seemed to be a good enough deal to get Jared Vanderbilt didn't work out. I mean, I I don't believe it was. I mean, maybe it was good enough, but they were offering two second round picks like six seven months ago. Yeah, I'm just saying that they were they were in it, and that's what the Blazers had offered basically was two second round picks. So I mean, maybe Danny Ainge would have lowered his asking price, but I mean, oh god, we were that far away from having a solid trade deadline but that's the thing you always got to have a backup plan steven this trade deadline speaks to me like they um wanted jared vanderbilt had all their eggs in the jared vanderbilt basket in the past supposedly they wanted cam johnson but matt ishbia coming into phoenix changed everything there um so they're so then there's okay we're going after jared vanderbilt dame wants him defender long lanky 
when the Lakers landed him, I think that surprised Joe Cronin. I I feel like he thought he was going to get Jared Vanderbilt, and then he didn't know what to do, which sounds ridiculous because you should always have a backup plan as a GM, but like this whole trade deadline reeks as somebody not having a plan because I don't feel like they achieved anything productive in any direction. I think the backup plan was like OG Ananobi, and uh, they didn't want to give up a million first-round picks because they can't. So, uh, yeah, I think that was the backup, and it didn't work out. You're and right. The backup was to try and trade GP2 for James Wiseman and more, even though GP2 didn't want to play here. Imagine the Warriors GM. The Warriors GM probably was sitting there on the phone like, huh, he doesn't want to play for you guys. He only went there because you offered him more than us. How are you trying to out-leverage me for a recent number two overall pick plus more? We're giving you a good deal by giving you James Wiseman for a guy who doesn't want to be there. I can't wait for GP2 to not be on the injury report. It's going to be so cool. Oh, yeah, he's going to play every game the rest of the year. He's going to play every game, be really good again. Oh, so frustrating. All right, well, just <sighs> typical Blazer fan stuff. Uh, I guess with that, Tori, uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. You got anything <laughs> else you want to add? <laughs> no, dude, this sucks. Yeah, well, all right. Well, th- I I'm appreciate everyone sleep. for... <laughs> Yeah, go go to sleep. Maybe it's just a bad dream. You don't know that. Uh, I appreciate everyone for listening to us. Uh, Believe in Blazers podcast presented by Bet Online. Catch Tori at Tori Jones YT. Catch my Blazers Uprise. All that good stuff. You know where that's at. I'm at Stephen underscore V O N on Twitter. Seven fifty the game every day. For my guy Tori Jones, I'm Stephen Vaughn. As always, come on Blazers. <laughs> Stop making trades. <laughs> Stop play. <laughs> As always, stop, Blazers. Stop Stop doing things. Just do something. (laughs) 